Corinthians chapter 3. A couple of questions from last week. Or not last week, last month, yes. Last month. Uh, What was the danger that was present in the church at Philippi? We talked about a specific danger that was there. False teachers, yes. And how does the Bible describe, uh, how we talked about these ways, there's, there's obviously other descriptions, but we talked about two descriptions of false teachers. We said they are blind guides and something in clothing, wolves in sheep clothing. Uh, and then chapter 3 begins with what? We talked about the very first point when we we talked about Philippians chapter 3. He says that uh, he wants to write the same thing to you. Indeed, it is not grievous, but to you it's safe. It starts with repetition. And we talked about the fact that repetition is important because it's how we learn things, uh, and repetition is throughout the Bible. Uh, What was Paul repeating to this church? There's two main concepts. Uh, in chapter 3, he's repeating. The first one is at the very beginning of the chapter. Um, he talks about rejoice in the Lord. And then the second is about the danger that was in the church to watch out for false teachers. And so the repetition was important because it was safe for them uh, that they would be saved from hurt. Uh, here's a hard question. What, what do the Judaizers believe? What, what was specific to the doctrine of the Judaizers? They believed something specific about salvation. Yeah, they believed that in order to be a Christian, you had to be a Jew in practice. And circumcision was a part of that. Um, but Paul said the believers are the circumcision. And uh, what does he mean by that? That we are the circumcision as believers. What's that? Yeah, so the, the idea there is that circumcision for a Jew was a mark that they were Jewish. It was a physical mark that they were Jewish. Uh, but we have a spiritual mark, uh, and it's a, it's a mark of the heart. Um, and so as believers, our confidence is to be found in, in who? In Jesus, in Christ, yeah. Um, what percentage of our confidence do we place in our flesh? Zero percent. Trick question there. <laughs> Uh, the Bible says we have no confidence in our flesh. And so what was Paul's reputation as far as having confidence in the flesh? And he says, well, if you want to have confidence in the flesh, then take a look at my resume. What was his resume? Yeah, he was a Pharisee. He was from what tribe? Benjamin. Uh, he was circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, he had, he had a, a quite the pedigree when he came to religion. Um, but what was the failure in this reputation? Paul says that all the things that he thought was bringing me near to God was actually pulling me away from the Lord. What was Paul's final view of his reputation compared to knowing Christ? He said, my reputation, all those things that I thought were bringing me closer to the Lord, he says, they are but, but dung. Yeah, and, uh, and you know what that means, so it's not a good thing. And what, what does being found in him mean? When we talked about, he says, and being found in Jesus. What does that mean? What does that statement mean, being found in him? What do you think? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Resting, resting in Jesus and not resting in ourselves, our salvation, resting in the work of Christ. What did Paul realize was the difference between a religious reputation and being found in Jesus? There was one important trait. Yeah, it's true. But when we take the next verse that we're looking at, he realized something important. And and we often say this to people, you know, when they say, well, you're religious. We say, well, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. You realize uh, 
that when he was religious, it was just a set of things that he did. But when he was found in Christ, that he realized he had a relationship with God. And that relationship made all the difference in the world because Paul could experience God's power, God's presence, and God's persuasion as he died to himself and he followed the will of God. All right, so the last study, we learned that, that Paul wanted to experience a Bible salvation and that God's power revealed in his life each and every day was sweet and wonderful, uh, was a wonderful fellowship that he enjoyed. Now in verse 11, and, and I know we separated this, but verse 11 really has to do with the, the verses above it when he says that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Verse 11 says, but by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, the structure of verse 11, when we look at it quickly, it almost sounds like Paul's questioning his place in heaven, that he's going to go in heaven or he's going to go to heaven. And and there's a lot of people that look at that and say, well, you know, the Bible says, if by any means, it, it sounds like he's doubting his salvation or he's doubting that he's going to, to go to heaven. But again, as Bible students, we compare Scripture with Scripture. We know right away that's not what Paul is saying because he already confirmed this uh, in, in chapter 1 where he, he says that he's in a, a straight betwixt two, you know, wanting to depart with Christ, which is far better. And so Paul had the confidence that he knew that he was going to go to heaven. But what this passage of Scripture is talking about is the means and, and how he was going to get there, he didn't know. And that's what he's questioning here. That's what he's doubting, is he understood he had a final destination, but how he was going to get to that final destination, he didn't know what means that was going to take place, whether it was going to be a martyr's death, uh, whether it was going to be a natural death, uh, or whether it would be the rapture. Paul was unsure how he was going to get to uh, heaven. Uh, but he knew that he was going to get there. And, and so when we look at these verses here, this relationship with the Lord and the final, um, you know, leaving this old world and, and entering in the presence of God and seeing the Lord and, and how he was going to get there, Paul uh, really didn't know the answer to that. Uh, but at the end of the day, he was, he was hopeful that uh, indeed that was, uh, that he would, he would indeed be with the Lord one day. And so we see in this passage of Scripture, uh, in verse 11, it kind of moves us into the next section uh, of this passage of Scripture. And that brings us to point number one here, and that is Paul's pursuit. Verse 12 is where we'll start here. He says, Not as though I had already obtained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend it, that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. So Paul realizes this important truth, and I think we would all realize this tonight. He realized he was not in heaven. <laughs> now remember, he's sitting in a Roman jail cell. He realized this is not where I want to be. This is not my final destination. It was obvious for Paul, obvious for us, that we're also, uh, obviously not in heaven. And, uh, and Paul also states that he was not perfect or that he didn't reach his goal in spiritual maturity. He had, he had made great progress in his spiritual life and his spiritual endeavors, but he recognized that there was still growing to do. Uh, Warren Wearsby, uh, in his commentary on Philippians, said he, was, he had a sanctified dissatisfaction, a sanctified dissatisfaction. Paul was satisfied in Christ, as mentioned in Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, but he wasn't satisfied with his, his Christian life. Uh, I read the story of uh, a gentleman that was a part of uh, sales, and uh, his name was Harry. And uh, I read this, this, this uh, story about Harry. It said Harry came out of the manager's office with a look on his face, dis, uh, with a dis, uh, missile look on his face, um, and, uh, and he, was, he, had, he just had an angry expression. And the secretary looked at Harry and said, did you get fired? And he said, no, it's not that bad, but he sure did lay into me about my sales record. I can't figure it out, he says. For the past month, I've been bringing in plenty of orders. I thought he'd compliment me, but instead he told me to get with it. Later in the day, the secretary talked to her boss about Harry. 
And the boss chuckled. He says, Harry is one of those salesmen that I hate to lose him. But he has a tendency to rest on his laurels and be satisfied with his performance. If I didn't get him mad at me once a month, he'd never produce. <laughs> and, and, and this passage of Scripture is the Apostle Paul looking at his own life, and, and uh, oftentimes we become self-satisfied because we compare our lives with, with other believers, and it's easy for us to do. But I, I think a mark of spiritual maturity is to acknowledge that we have not arrived and uh, that we have more growing to do. John 21, verse 21 Peter, seeing him, saith unto Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Now, Peter here, uh, he just denied the Lord. Jesus comes to him in chapter 21, relationships restored. And then Peter looks at John and says, what is this guy going to do? And uh, Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is it to thee follow thou me? In other words, Jesus said, Peter, it's not your business. You just make sure you follow me. And, and oftentimes in our Christian life, we can look at other people and look at other Christians, and uh, we become satisfied with where we are in our Christian life or our spiritual maturity uh, because we, we look better, we look more mature than they do. Uh, and this is dangerous for us, for us to do. The Bible says, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. So we don't want to compare ourselves with other Christians. Uh, we want to make sure we look to the Lord. And so we see the pursuit of Paul. We see, first of all, his desire. And it's interesting in this passage of Scripture, because if we read this little expression here, if I may apprehend it, that for which also I am apprehended, you think to yourself, what in the world are you saying there? That It sounds like a puzzle almost. But Paul was apprehended and, and this is what he's saying here. He was apprehended or he was captivated by Jesus Christ when he was walking down the road of Damascus. He was going to persecute Christians. And he was knocked to the ground on the road of Damascus as the Lord said to him, Saul, Saul. Uh, and Saul said, who art thou? And he says, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And the response of Saul was, what will you have me to do? He was captivated. He was apprehended at that very moment in his life. And when we trusted Christ as our Savior, when we got saved, we were apprehended. And we belonged to the Lord Jesus. Now, Paul was on a journey. And in this journey, he wanted to, to capture or to apprehend what Christ had apprehended him for. And this is what he's saying in that passage of Scripture, is that he had been apprehended by the Lord, and now he wanted to to capture all that Christ had for him. And this is his spiritual maturity is what he, he's talking about, his growth and being more like the Lord. And so notice his determination, verse 13. He, he says, his brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. So, so he wanted to apprehend all that Christ had for him. Or, or he's speaking here of our, his spiritual maturity, his growth. And, and he says here in verse 13, brethren, he's writing to believers, he says, I want you to know, this is Paul the Apostle, okay? I mean, we would say uh, in layman terms that he was probably the greatest missionary outside the Lord Jesus that ever walked this earth. I think we would agree with that. And yet he's saying, listen, as far as capturing all that Christ has for me and my growth, he says in verse 13, I have not apprehended that. I have not captured that. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. So Paul realized that he had more capturing to do. He had more growth to do. And, and I love the focus here because he says, one thing I do. There was one focus in his life. Um, in the Bible, it's a great study. and We don't have time tonight to study it all out, but the one thing that the Bible talks about. Does anyone know off the top of their head throughout the Bible when the, when the Bible talks about one thing? Uh, there's three times I can think about in the Bible. Three specific stories, though, where that, that expression is, is used, one thing. Does anyone remember? I'll give, you a, I'll give you the first one. Jesus told the self-righteous ruler he said to him, one thing thou lackest. Mark chapter 10, verse 21. 
Do we remember another one where one thing is mentioned? I'll give you a hint. It happened with, with sisters. Two sisters. One thing is needful, Mary and Martha. Martha was working really hard. Mary was at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus said to Martha, she was complaining about her sister, and Jesus said, Martha, one thing is needful. And then there's one passage of Scripture in the book of Psalms that talks about it. Oh, sorry, there's another one in John, John chapter 9. John chapter 9, you know the story. Um, one thing, when the, the blind man was healed, and they had all these theological questions about who Jesus was, and the blind man said, listen, I don't know any of those answers, but one thing I know, I was blind and now I see. One thing I know. And then there's another uh, thought found in the book of Psalms. In Psalm 27, um, it talks about, and I think this is what you, no, no, it has one thing in there. One thing, oh, I, this, I, think this is, I think this is what you're saying. One thing have a desired of the Lord. Yeah, that's, I just have the one expression. You kept going. But yeah, one thing have I desired of the Lord. Psalm 27 in verse number four. So, so Paul says here, one thing I do. One thing I do. I, I read an a illustration about D.L. Moody. Um, before the tragedy of the Chicago fire in 1871, Mr. Moody was involved in Sunday school promotions, YMCA work, evangelistic meetings, and many other activities. But after the fire, he determined to devote himself exclusively to evangelism. One thing I do, he said, and because uh, of this, millions of people heard the gospel. His focus, his focus was on one thing. And this is what Paul is saying in the scripture. The one thing I do uh, was to focus his attention on spiritual maturity, to capture all that Christ had uh, for his life. And you know, we would be justified to say, Paul, listen, you've done enough. You've grown enough. You've gone so far. I mean, you were a murderer, and now you're a missionary. I mean, come on, Paul. You've owed, you've owed matured all of us. Uh, but he wasn't satisfied with that. There was more capturing to be done. He wanted to know the Lord more and more. And so we see how he's going to achieve this. Here's the specifics of it. Number one here, forgetting the past, forgetting the past. I'm sure that Paul struggled with his past. I'm sure that the devil tried to throw his past in his face all of the time. Uh, and the reality is we can't change our past. In Bible terminology, the Bible says here that we are to, uh, to forget our past. But the Bible terminology of forget does not mean fail to remember. It's impossible for us to have a a memory lapse, and just forget about our past. But this is what the Bible talks about when it uses the word forget. It means that we are no longer being influenced by our past. We are going to not live in our past anymore. We are going to look to the future. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 17, for their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The Bible isn't saying that God just, you know, is going to have a bad memory. He's not going to remember our sin. That's not what he's saying at all. It's saying that God will not hold our sins against us. That he makes that decision that he will not remember our sins anymore. And so many Christians live in the shackles of their past. And I'm sure that Paul, of all the damage that he did to the Christian church, he, says, he said specifically that he wasted the church. And so I'm sure he had uh, regrets in his past. But he says here, I'm going to forget the past and I'm going to reach onto those things which are before. It's a mindset of spiritual growth and maturity. He says in verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so to press means to follow after. It's an intense endeavor. Uh, the Greek used the word there to press. It's, the Greeks used the, used the word to describe a hunter who's pursuing his prey. And, and this, this is what Paul is talking about this intense endeavor in his life. He's going to press. He's going to press toward the mark. In chapter, chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul spoke of the same zeal that, that he used, the pressing, the same zeal he used to persecute the church. And all of the zeal that he used to persecute the church, now he's using that zeal to grow the church. Isn't that wonderful? 
and that people would come to the Lord. He, he's pressing toward the mark. The goal is always God in our life. Our, the goal is always God. And the reward is, uh, and we are rewarded for our faithfulness to him. Number two, let's notice this, Paul's patience. Paul's patience. We see in verse 15, the Bible says this, let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded. And if anything, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Now, all of us here tonight are not at the same place spiritually. And, and I'm not saying this tongue in cheek, but that's, that's wonderful because, I, I mean, that's, God understands that. And we should never get upset uh, by someone's lack of spiritual maturity or someone's spiritual maturity. Now, the writer of Hebrews got upset at the lack of believer spiritual maturity because they should have been teachers, but instead they were babes in Christ. And the lack of growth based, based on carnality should never be celebrated. And we see that over and over in the Bible. Uh, but the reality is, is that we are in different places in our spiritual life, and this is normal with any church because we're all growing. And Paul recognized that. Because Paul is pursuing the Lord uh, with all of his might as a hunter would pursue his prey. That's his goal. The one thing that he does is to pursue God in his life. And he says in verse 15, he says, listen, all of us, as many as be perfect. And the thought there of perfect is not uh, spiritual perfection where we are beyond sin. But it's speaking of maturity, roundedness. That's the idea there that the word is used. And so he's saying those that are mature in the Lord, he said, this is the attitude that we want to have. We want to pursue the Lord. And even when we are mature in the Lord, we still have growing to do, right? I, I think if Paul still had growing to do, we we'll probably have some growing to do. And, and we notice Paul's desire here. Paul understood the fact, uh, understood that, and and Paul didn't get angry at people. He didn't get upset at people where they were spiritually. But look what he says in verse number 15, his attitude, his desire. You remember, he's talking about the attitude of forgetting the past, pursuing Christ and his plan for the future. We notice Paul's patience here. Paul's desire for them was to grow, but he understood that it was God's work in someone's, in someone's life. And he says here in this passage of Scripture, he says, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded. So if you don't have the same attitude as me, Paul says, if you're not at the same place as me, I love this, God shall reveal even this unto you. Paul wasn't going to force someone to follow his instruction, but he offered truth, and he knew that the Holy Spirit would do the work in their life. And he was patient with people as they grew. Because ultimately... God is our teacher. I, I can present the Bible to you, and that has always been my ministry, to present the word of God. This is what God says. But I understand it's the Holy Spirit that instructs us and guides us into all truth. And we cannot make anyone obey the Bible. We just present the word of God, and people have to make a choice. And being a spiritual leader takes patience, and Paul was patient. And Paul, we see his patience in this passage of Scripture. Now, was Paul hurt? Sure he was hurt. You know, he wrote the church of Galatia, and he says, you know, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Was Paul hurt? Absolutely, but he was patient. And he understood that people had growing to do. And then we notice Paul's devotion in verse 16. He says, nevertheless, whereto we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. So for those who were spiritually mature, we're going to continue on that straight pathway is what he's saying in this scripture. We're going to hold on to what we have and we're going to press toward more spiritual growth. And he says in the scripture, let us walk by the same rule. We are guided by God's divine truth. The Bible always wins. It always wins. Not my opinion, not your opinion, not a church creed. The Bible is our final authority. And so he says here, listen, we're going to be guided by the same truth. We're going to have the same mind, the attitude that we have toward the Bible, the spiritual maturity. We're going to let God do the work in someone's heart. 
This is Paul's devotion, but notice Paul's direction. I love this because he presents himself as an example. And this is a tough thing to do, to present yourself as an example. A lot of responsibility. Verse 17, he says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk as so as ye have us for an example. Those who are following God, and that's the key, those who are following God. Paul was following God. He says they're examples for us to follow. Uh, and Paul says to mimic my good example, mark them, take notice of them. By the way, we want to be that good example for our family, for the church. And we, want be able, we want people to be able to mark us and say, hey, uh, I'm going to follow their example. Two markings in the Bible that Paul talks about. He talks about marking those as good examples, and he talks about marking those who are disorderly and are bad examples. He says, avoid them. So mark those who are good examples, follow them. And he says, mark those who are bad examples, avoid them. Now notice Paul's dismay in verse 18. The Bible says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, I don't believe that Paul is talking here about believers. I believe he's talking about, verse 18, non-believers. And I think that they were those who claimed to be saved, who made a profession of salvation, but by their walk they denied the Lord. And Titus talks about that. And they were leading people away from Christ. And this is why we see Paul's dismay, because he's saying this even weeping. His heart is broken. Uh, They were maybe those that were in the church, that were influential in the church, uh, that had become false teachers. They made claims of being a Christian, but they were not born again. And they had become the enemies of the cross of Christ. You could be enemies of a lot of things, but don't be the enemy of the cross of Christ. Uh, Because when you become the enemy of the cross of Christ, you become the enemy of God. And uh, you don't want God as your enemy. And so we see Paul's dismay, but notice their destruction, verse 19. He says here, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Those who had become the enemy of the cross of Christ, we notice their description here. The Bible says here, in simple terms, their end is doom. Their end is doom. God ultimately will be their judge. But also their pursuit is their own appetite. They only care about themselves. I, I was uh, watching a testimony of a man. Uh, he, was, uh, he became a born-again Christian. He was an alcoholic. And uh, he says in this testimony that he was destroying his life. Uh, he was so mean. He says, he says, looking back at my life, He says, I was a vile man, and I was so mean to my children and to my wife. Um, Just, he says, I was just so mean to them. And he he wanted to get better. He wanted to to get um, things right in his life. And so he read, he says, I read all the self-help books, tried to get my life in order, and he says, none of those things worked. Uh, And he says, he was at wit's end. He says, I ended up in an AA meeting trying to find some answers. And... um, He said it was during that AA meeting that there was a gentleman there that told him if he wanted to get on the right path, he's going to have to talk to God. And this man said, well, I don't believe in God. He said, then you're going to have to talk to someone bigger than yourself, a higher power. And that man said he went home and he thought about it for days. And he says, it broke my heart to think about the life I was living. He says, I realized that in my own attitude, There was no one else bigger than me. I was living my life all for myself. And I think this is the example here. By the way, that man uh, went back to talk to that individual. He was a born-again Christian, led him to Christ, changed his life. Uh, Just a wonderful testimony. But this is what the Bible is talking here about these false teachers, these enemies of the cross of Christ, that their pursuit in their life was their own appetite. Their God is their belly. And it's, it's not specifically talking about food, but it's just talking about the idea of the appetites of our flesh and that we have become or they had become their own gods. And it was not about anyone else. It was all about them. It was all about their appetites, their desires. They had become their own god. And, uh, and this is what Paul is saying. He says their pursuit is their appetite. 
Their, their entire life is all about them, all about pleasing themselves. Um, and they glory in their shameful conduct, that their glory was in their sin and their, their sinful conduct. And they only minded, they only were concerned about earthly things, temporal things. This is how they lived their life. And this is what Paul, how Paul described these enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's saying this weeping. I'm sure there's tears flowing from his eyes as he's penning these words or he's, he's dictating these words to someone penning this letter uh, as he thinks about these individuals um, that had become enemies to the church in Christ. Thirdly, we see Paul's perspective in verse 20. So because of all of this, now let's ra- we're going to wrap up this chapter, this thought here. Because of all of this, we see Paul's perspective. He says, verse 20, For our conversation is in heaven, for whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, uh, that it shall be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working thereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So we notice here Paul's perspective and the perspective that he wants us to have. Uh, just two simple thoughts. Number, uh, letter A here, our confidence. And he says here, our conversation, an old English word, it means our, our citizenship, our, our life, our citizenship. We, we belong to heaven is what he's saying. Our citizenship is in heaven. Uh, when I crossed the border, um, I was told that, that my son, who was 17, had to have uh, a passport. Uh, be, when you're 16, you have to have a passport. And I had, I had mit, uh, mixed messages. Uh, the website said that um, I, I couldn't cross. Uh, I called the border. They said it would be fine. And so when I got to the border of the USA, I was, I was nervous. I mean, I drove two hours to get to the border. And I mean, worst thing, I, I didn't think they were going to kill me or anything, but they could turn me back home. And it's a two-hour drive back. It's four hours of my time, and I really got nowhere. And so I was kind of nervous when I got to the border, but everything was fine. We crossed no problems. Now, when I returned to Canada, I wasn't nervous at all. I mean, they could give me a hard time, but I knew they were going to let me in because I'm a citizen of Canada. They have to let me in my own country. And, and this is what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, listen, I'm a citizen of heaven. This world is not my home. Uh, it, it's really contrary to the view of the false teachers, right, who mind earthly things. Paul's perspective was he was looking for a heavenly city. And in verse 20, he says, we're looking for the Savior. We're awaiting with great expectation the coming of Christ, uh, which I believe is the normal attitude of a citizen of heaven. Uh, we, want to, we want to be with the Lord. And so this was his expectation. He says, listen, I, I have this expectation in my life, this confidence in my life uh, that uh, I want to be with the Lord. And I'm a citizen of heaven, and I'm looking for the Lord Jesus in verse 21 we see not only the confidence, but our change. And uh, the Bible says here that the Lord Jesus, it says he's looking for the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 21 flows into that. It says, who shall change our vile body? God will change our bodies of humiliation, our, our bodies that is cursed by sin to ones that are fit for heaven. That's a wonderful thought. It will be a glorious body, a body conformed to the very glory of Christ. Now, here's, here's how the, the, the uh, uh, Apostle Paul ends this thought here. He says this, look at this, working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, what does that mean? It means that, that the Lord is going to transform or recreate our vile bodies into a glorified body. And the Bible says here that this is going to be according to the power where all things are subject under his authority. And and I believe that this is talking about the power of creation, where he created all things. God is is all-powerful. He created this world in six literal days by example. He He could have created it in one word, you know, he just spoke one word and all of it would have been created. He's all powerful and all things submit to him. And in the power of creation, the Bible says that through that same power, he's going to recreate and he's going to change our bodies into a body that is glorified by his power. And this is what Paul's expectation was as he was waiting for the Lord uh, to come back. And we don't know how 
we're going to leave this earth. We don't know uh, how we will see the Lord, whether by the rapture, whether by death. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but we know this, that when that day comes and he calls, we'll see him face to face. And there'll be a wonderful transformation as our vile bodies, our sinful bodies, will be made like his glorious body. What a, what a wonderful day that will be. Let's pray, gentlemen. Lord,